Dropping an index before 12.2. So first of all, the reason I brought this topic up is I have to apologize because I obviously got it wrong in terms of the talk I did on 12.2 because I had a number of people contact me after the Indian event saying, oh, this new 12.2 feature means I just have to look at this particular database view, which we'll cover in a second, and that tells me if I can drop the index. No, 12.2 is good. It's a lot better than previous releases, but this is the key slide. I, I stress this is perhaps my, my own defense. I put this slide in every presentation I made about indexes in 12.2. The new information we give you in 12.2 is to help your brain not replace it. It's to augment the decision-making process, not just say, yep, this tells you yes or no, we can drop an index. And here's the problem. You have a table called sales, and if it's got a sales, it's probably got a primary key because most good tables have a primary key. But you might want to do query by customer. So you'll have a customer index. And then you might want to query, for example, this week's sales. So you'll probably have a sales date index. You might want to query by product, and then you'll have a product index. And you can see how these things occur. As each query requirement comes up, more and more and more indexes get created. And often they're like um, what I call rush jobs. Someone says, I've got this end of month process. It's running really slow. Here's the worst query. And rather than redesign the table, redesign the query, maybe the quick and dirty fix is, look, let's put an index on that solves that particular problem. And of course, then six months later, you're going, well, which ones of those are still used? And that's the big challenge. Now in 12.2, we gave you this thing called DBA index usage, which I've spoken about at length before. So I'm just going to fly through this one very quickly. It's really cool in the sense that it gives you some really nice metrics in terms of the total number of times the index was used, how many rows were accessed, some basic histogram information to give you a broader set of information as to make decisions. And the key one is the last use. When was the last time this table, this index was used? That's all inputs into actually deciding whether you can drop an index, but, Two counter examples that hopefully show you that just relying on that information is not good enough. Even in 12.2, I stress that if you've got that view in 12.2, even there, you, there, I can give you two counter examples which prove to you that you need to have your DBA thinking cap on before you just go drop indexes. The first one's a no brainer. Foreign key locking, as we know, to avoid certain kinds of locks on tables, we might need to put indexes on the child tables that refer back to a parent. If those indexes are present, the need for them to avoid excessive locking is not picked up in that DBA index usage table. Obviously, if you use that index in a query, then yes, it will be picked up. But if it's just there to prevent additional table level locks, it's not picked up in DBA index usage. So you still need to be able to look at the database and look at, for example, DBA constraints, which actually has a index name column, which tells you which indexes are used to implement internally the validation of a constraint. So you can look up your foreign key constraints and those indexes, you can't really drop them unless you're positive, you're not gonna have the foreign key locking issues. The second one is the fact that index structures also contain index statistics. Here's a table called T1, and here's a simple query, C1 equals 12 in there in blue, and C2 equals 12. We know in advance that the answer is 200. Nothing, no magic here. We know that that particular query returns 200 rows. The question is, what does the optimizer think? Well, the optimizer's miles out. It actually thinks that it's four rows. The reason for that is the optimizer doesn't store statistics on the correlation between columns. It knows how many rows of C1 equals 12. It probably knows how many rows of C2 equals 12, but it doesn't know the correlation between those two columns. What if I put an index on those two columns? Well, if you look there at the rows column in the execution plan, now the optimizer has got the result or the estimate spot on. But key thing here is look at the actual plan. It didn't end up using the index. It was still going for table access full, but what it did do is use the statistics on the index to come up with a really good rows estimate. So if I was to drop that index as a DBA because it didn't appear in DBA index usage, even in 12.2, then I might actually make this execution plan go bad because I'm no longer giving it good statistics. I could create extended statistics to handle the correlation between those values and then drop the index. But I'm just stressing the fact that just because the index data suggests in the DBA index usage view in 12.2 that an index can be dropped, 
doesn't mean you can just drop it. But what are the pre 12.2 options? Obviously you don't get that data at all in, in 12.1 and below. So what do we do? Or perhaps a better way of saying it is, even if I have DBA index usage in 12.2, maybe this, these options here can help you augment that information. The first one you can do is index monitoring. Now this is the thing that probably DBA index uses is in time to replace, but that still doesn't mean you can't take advantage of it. And it's pretty simple. If you're on 12.1 or below, you simply do alter index monitoring usage, and that will put a row in the V dollar object usage table. A quick thing here, which I forgot to mention when I was in India, is the V dollar object usage view is not your sort of run of the mill V dollar table. It actually is bound to the schema. If I need to be in the schema that actually has turned on monitoring for that particular index to actually see it, it's not like a V dollar view where you can see everything. But when I do alter index table PK monitoring usage, you can see it appears there, it's monitored, yes, but it's column of view says, no, I've not used it yet. I then go ahead and do a query on effectively that column. And guess what? It sets used equals yes, but that's it. And this is why we've effectively re-engineered the whole thing in 12.2. That's the only information you get. How can I use this? Well, that's of some use, obviously it's not fantastic, but it's of some use, but you know, what you could do is you could extend this operation yourself. Once an index has been detected as being used, that's it, it's set to yes, it will never go back to no. But what you could do is you could, for example, collect, say, at 9 a.m., alter index monitoring, and then wait for a while and see all the indexes have said used equals yes. Now you can go through and turn them all off again. And then, effectively, you can now run for, say, another 30 minutes and then collect it again. This way, you can actually collect over time which indexes are being used rather than just having that one indicator saying, yes, at some stage it was used. Now, I want to stress here that if you're doing this, you want to do it not overly frequently. It might be, say, 9 a.m., turn on monitoring, which, whichever one's come on at yes, maybe it's, say, 10 a.m., turn them off again, etc. The reason for that is every time you change the monitoring to yes for an index, what we do is to do our best chance at actually collecting that information for you, this is from Oracle Nine we actually say the next query that uses that index will do a hard pass. Every time you flick the monitoring switch on, you're going to have a little boost in hard parsing operations on your database. So be aware of that. It's not something you're going to say, let's flick monitoring between yes and no every 30 seconds because you're going to set up a massive pass storm for yourself. The second one is, well, rather than seeing if indexes are used, go look for indexes and just see if they're, or they could be redundant simply by definition. Let's look at this table here called T. It's a copy of DBA objects. It's got a couple of indexes on it. One IX1 is on the owner column. And the second one IX2 is on owner comma object name. An index like that, we can pretty much know that if I did select star from T where owner equals Scott, then if the first index IX1 didn't exist, the second index would be sufficient. I could still use the owner column because it's the leading column in the index. And obviously the second query, select from T where owner equals Scott and object name equals M. That could definitely use the second index. If an index simply is effectively a subset of what I call a, a longer index or an index that has more columns, so the leading columns of one index are totally contained within the leading columns of a second index, you could make an argument that that first index could perhaps be dropped. Now I'm stressing the perhaps here. How do I identify this? It's actually pretty easy to do as long as you're on 11 and above because we have the list tag function. So what I can do with list tag, you can see in the query there, is for each particular index, I can produce a concatenation of all the columns in the index. I can now effectively do a join of that result set to itself to see, and you can see there on line 24 is the superset columns for an index, the beginning of uh, and some other index, is some other index totally contained in the leading columns of the superset index. And we can see there, I got the result there, which simply said in my table, in my schema called Scott, index number one is actually supersetted by index number two. But, and this is why I said perhaps, yes, it is true that by definition, one index there, the second one with two columns could do the job of both. That doesn't mean it's a guaranteed proposition. Let's look at this example. Here's my two indexes still in play. Select star from T where owner equals Scott, and I'm using index number one that had the column of just owner in the index. I drop that index thinking that my other index is totally fine and is gonna do the job, but look at the execution plan I got. I actually ended up with table access full. Even though index number two on owner and object name is still present, the database costed it differently. Just because it had the same leading column doesn't mean it'll be costed the same way because the index size is different. If it's got more columns in the index, 
the index size, the index clustering factor, the index distribution is different. In fact, if I force a hint in there, we can actually see that the cost there, if I flick back one value, the cost there was uh, 424 for the full table scan. And when I forced it to use the index that I thought it was going to use, it came cost out at 1013. And that's why it went for the full table scan. The third option you have is segment statistics. There's a view called V dollar segment statistics, which captures a whole lot of information at the segment level. It catches things like database block changes, logical reads, a whole stack of other stuff as well, especially if it's in the in memory store. Picking out information at a segment by segment basis is once again, an input to information about how you could maybe track where the indexes are being used. So let's think about an index. Obviously, if I insert, update, or delete rows, then the index has to change. To get to a particular value in an index, a particular row, a particular entry, I'd obviously have to start from the root, go down to a branch, and then find the actual leaf. I'll keep this simple and assume it's just a unique index, so we're just gonna find the one leaf. With a range scan, things get a bit more complicated. For every time we change a row, we're gonna do maybe three, maybe two or three reads on the index. Obviously, when we query an index, we'll be doing the same operation, root, branch, leaf, but lots and lots of queries means lots and lots and lots of traverses down that index. We're making a lot of assumptions here, but we could look at VDOLA segment statistics and say, if the number of block changes is say half or maybe a third, somewhere around there of the number of reads, we could make an assumption that the only operations we're doing are these kind of ones. So every time I do a change, I'm doing three reads. So for each, change, for each change, three reads, if the number of changes is roughly three times, one third the number of reads, it's an input to the case of maybe this only being used for DML and therefore not being any beneficial for queries. Obviously, if it's doing this kind of operation, we're seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of logical reads and not many block changes, then we have confidence that the index is in active use. As I said, I'm making a lot of assumptions here because Obviously, we don't control, we don't control how V dollar segment stats is populated. We don't know whether it's every single captured change. We don't know whether it captures, for example, the walking down the root and the branch or whether it just captures changes on the leaf or just queries on all. You know, all those things are sort of up for debate. So it's important, as I said, it's another input into our decision making process. And we've got another one which is using V dollar SQL plan. Obviously, if I'm using an index in a query or even a DML, it will generally appear in the execution plan. So what I could do is a query something along these lines. Go get the object name, I'm looking at the blue text here, go get the object name and count star for every single object I can find in VLS SQL plan. And I'm just doing a simple outer join to my list of indexes. If I get a hit, then I know that that index name definitely is currently in at least one execution plan in VLS SQL plan. And therefore it leads me on to having more information about how to actually make that decision. But of course, that information in VDL SQL plan is transient. The moment an SQL gets aged out, it's no longer there. Now you could, for example, go data mining and DBA hist SQL plan if you're using things like AWR. As I said, it's inputs, be careful. It's just helping you add to the, the, the pyramid of information that's gonna help you make a decision. In all cases, if you've gone through all those steps and decided, yep, I am going to drop that index, please do this. Make it invisible first. That's available since Oracle 11. That keeps the index and keeps all the index content. And what's more, as DML occurs, keeps that index still up to date. It just makes it unavailable to the optimizer. This is what I call the see if someone screams option. You make it invisible and you wait for the phone call. And if no phone call comes, maybe wait for a month. I stress, have some patience. After all, just wait, 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 wait. And then maybe think about dropping it. And I will say one last thing on indexes um, in terms of dropping them is, Make sure you have a reason for dropping it. It's very easy to get stuck into a, well, that index might not be used, so I should drop it. But if it's not having any impact on your DML, your inserts, update, deletes, and it's not having impact, any impact on your queries, then yes, it might be wasted, but who cares? Who cares about a few gigabytes?